Good morning, church. Thank you very much, Genesis, for reading our scripture today. And I'd like to thank uh, Mimbo and his family too for rendering that beautiful song that I believe have uh, prepared our hearts for God's message. I'm also grateful to see many of our visitors and friends who have come to join us from the uh, southern part of the border. Thank you for being a part of our worship today. This is my third uh, uh, time to preach a sermon here in my new, my new assignment uh, church and uh, I'm so glad that uh, the number has greatly multiplied since the first uh, time I preached a sermon here. Uh, it, it means that God is working in our hearts and uh, the, spirit of, uh, the spirit of revival and the spirit of reconciliation is powerfully working in each of our hearts that uh, all of us have decided to make God first and make his Sabbath a very important appointment with him especially in these difficult and challenging times that we are living in. One of the devotional, how many of you were at Camp Hope during the uh, camp meeting? Okay. Thank you very much. I saw a few hands. How, how many of you were there during the Sabbath services? The Sabbaths. Okay, thank you. Quite a good number. In one of the devotionals that was given, one of the favorite devotionals that I have given was about a preacher who told us or told the brethren of his ideal church. And he said with passion, he said, I love this church and I want to belong to this church. I was thinking that he will be mentioning some churches in America or some churches in British Columbia. But then in the process of his presentation, he said, I like this church, you know? You know where this church is, uh, is located? And he said, this church is located in the book of Acts. It was the first Christian church that was organized by Jesus himself with the first inner circles that he had, the disciples, of course. And we call this church, he said, we call this church the apostolic church. And he gave five reasons why this church is his ideal church. I would like to share this to you in review of what he said. In connection to my message this morning, he said, I like this church because it is a provocative church. He, by the way, his description starts with five letter P's. So the first one is he said, I like this church because it is a provocative church. So I was wondering, why, the, why is it that he liked this church, a provocative church? Do you like a provocative church? I was trying to decipher, I said, do you mean to say that he loves a church that is arguing, always discussing, always competing, or always fighting? Is that what he means by a provocative church? Then he qualified, he said, that is not what I mean. I don't mean that a church that is provocative is a church that continue to argue and discuss and fight about simple things in the church. But he said, I like the apostle, apostolic church because it will not settle on the status quo. Amen? That means he loves the apostolic church because it loves it. The church wants to try new ideas, new programs, new, new uh, methods of worship, and other new things. So he said, I like this church because it provokes your thought of making or, or creating many methods and ways so that we can reach out to our community. Second, he said, I like the apostolic church because it is a persecuted church. How would you like our church to be persecuted? Huh? How many of you have been persecuted by your loved ones when you, when you accepted the Adventist message? Oh, I saw Sister uh, Tess Hans here. A few of us. My mother told me that when she was 13 years old, 
She read the great controversy and the Bible sold to him by a literature evangelist. And when she accepted the Adventist message, her mother has to disown her. She was driven away from home. And, and starting that time, uh, until I graduated in college, her mother will not talk to her because she was a heretic. A heretic because she, has, she was believing in a different religion than her, her mother, who was the leader of the Catholic Church during that time in her, in her village. So she suffered a lot of persecution from her mother. How about you? How about me? I was never persecuted. As an Adventist, as a pastor, I have never experienced being persecuted. But you know, the apostolic church was persecuted. And uh, how many of you would like, our, would like our church here to be persecuted? What will happen if we will be persecuted, for instance? Probably many of us will be more faithful to the Lord, right? I remember the president of uh, Mindanao, South Philippine Union Conference, Pastor uh, Paterno Diaz. He said, I, lie, I, like, I like when there is war in Mindanao. I love always when there is war in Mindanao. I said, Pastor, why? You know what? He said, Pastor Estores, when there is war in Mindanao, the brethren always will never miss the, week, the middle, mid, uh, midweek prayer meeting. They will never miss attending the Bispers meeting. They will never miss the Sabbath worship because they're afraid. Their life is uncertain. There is war always. And they would like to be secured in God's hand. But why is it that some of us are not interested in prayer meetings? Why is it that many members of our church are not interested in Bispers meeting, in midweek prayer meetings? It's probably because we are living on a peaceful land of freedom where we have all the opportunity and the freedom to worship God. But what about if we are persecuted? Oh, probably we will be like also the what? The apostolic church. And he said, I like the apostolic church because it was also a what? A prayerful church. Prayerful church. They were praying. Acts 2, 42 to 45. Every day, they will gather together and they will have a potluck. After that, they will pray together and study the doctrine. What a beautiful church. Every night, not only every Wednesday night, not only every Friday night, but every night they will gather together and pray. What a what? What a prayerful, prayerful church. And, and fourth, he said, I like the apostolic church because it is a participative church. Amen? You know what? Our mass media, our sports life in Canada and in North America are training us to be spectators, not to be participants. And you know, spectators are not the one that win championships. Uh, spectators do not win awards. They only criticize the players, right? But participants are the one that would what? That would win championship. God's church, church God's church should be a participative church. Amen. And I love to see, I love to see our church here, sorry Filipino, because even our young people are participating. Please continue to do that. This is God's way of helping us become an ideal church. And the last one he said is that, I love the church because it is a powerful church. Why did you say that the apostolic church was a powerful church? Why is that? Because the persecutor itself became converted. Remember, when the church, apostolic church was persecuted, they stoned Stephen to death. The first martyr of the, the Christian martyr was Stephen. And who was responsible in signing his death? Saul of Tarsus. He was the greatest persecutor. And he signed the papers to stone Stephen to death. But you know, because of the prayers of this powerful church, Saul of Tarsus met 
the God of the persecuted church, right there in the road to Damascus. And he was blinded by the light of this way, the truth, and the light, the life. Who is the source of their light? Jesus Christ. And when he was blinded, what happened to Saul of Tarsus? He said, Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? I would like, I will not give you the detail, but Saul of Tarsus was led by the Lord to meet the apostles and he was indoctrinated. He accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And the greatest persecutor became the greatest what? Became the greatest apostle. We know him as Apostle Paul. And so this church was what? Was a great church. It was a powerful church. But how did, I'd like to connect my message here. How did this church become such a wonderful church with five Ps? First, what was the first one? Provocative church. Second, persecuted church. Third, prayerful church. Fourth, participative church. Fifth, it was a powerful church. How did they achieve this status as such kind of church? Did it become to them as automatic because they accepted Christ? Just after their baptism, they become like that as a church? No. How did this church attain such a status. I studied the book of Acts this month and I found out that the secret of the apostolic church was, was found in one of the challenges of Paul to them in 1 Timothy 4.7. What is Paul saying to us? 1 Timothy 4.7 and this was his challenge to all the believers who believe in the apostles' messages. And today, this is also the challenge. First Timothy 4, 7. What does the Bible say? This idea about this ideal church. In one version it says there, and train yourself to be what? Godly. In the King James Version it says there, discipline yourself to be godly. What does it say? Discipline yourself. It is not a discipline imposed by others. It is not a discipline imposed by your parents. It is not a discipline imposed by the pastor. It is a discipline that is self-imposed. When Paul said, discipline yourself to be godly, it means a self-imposed what? Discipline. And what are these self-imposed discipline that Paul would like us or, challenges or is challenging us? First, he wants us to have the discipline of personal devotion. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? He wants us to have the discipline of what? Personal devotion. What do you mean by personal devotion? It is a time that you set between you and God alone. It is different from public worship. It is dif different from family worship. It is a time when it is you and God alone talk together. That is what we call the discipline of what? Personal devotion. Paul is saying that we need to know the difference between the important and the urgent. Paul is saying, do the most important first before the urgent. You know, this is one of the greatest temptations here in North America. We are too busy. And our Lord is crowded out. Amen? Is this true? Too busy. Too busy. But what is the Bible telling us? From the words of Jesus himself, what did he say to the, he say to the disciples? But seek ye first, the what? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? And all these things shall be added unto you. Do not reverse the text. Because many of us are saying, I will seek first all these things of this world. And then Christ will be added unto me and his kingdom. No. God's priority is, is this, very clear. Seek ye first the what? The kingdom of God. If, if Jesus speaks if one, he will say, Busa unaha una ninyo pagpangita ang ginharian sa Diyos. O ang iyang pagkamataron 
pagkamatarong unya ang tanang mga butang, igadugang raunya kaninyo. If Jesus was an ilonggo, he would say, gani o pangitaan ninyo, sing una ang ginarian sang Diyos, kag ang tanan nga mga butang, igadugang lamang sa inyo. Right? If Jesus was an ilokano, what would he say, Brother John? Ngem birokin nyo nga umuna ti pagarian ti Diyos, kinti kinalintig na. Kiti so amin, dagit, uh, kiti so amin, uh, dagitoy, kiti so amin, dagitoy, abanbanag, mainayan danto kada kayo. Wow. Wow. How many of us are learning? I would like to challenge all of us this morning as we go out from this hall of worship. Let it be one of our resolve to say this to yourself and say, Jesus, help me by your grace. And your grace is sufficient for me. That is your promise. That I will learn how to decipher between the urgent and the important. Before doing the urgent, I will do first the what? The most important. Looking for your family is, impor- is urgent. Going to school is urgent. Studying your lesson, young people, is urgent. Fulfilling your job is urgent. Reporting to our work is urgent. But the most important thing in this world is what? Talk first to your creator and to your maker, to your savior, before anything else. Amen? Amen. This is what we call the discipline of personal devotion. Self-imposed discipline of personal devotion. Second, the second is the discipline of prayer. The discipline of prayer. What do I mean when I say the discipline of prayer? How many of us are grateful to God every morning when we wake up? What is our primary responsibility when we woke up? Ellen White said, talk to God first, right? So talking to God are two ways. We allow God to talk to us through the study of God's word. But we talk to God through prayer. So these two are important. Studying God's word through personal devotion and prayer is very important. Be grateful to God in the morning. Do not be grateful to your alarm clock. Be grateful to God that you're alive. Amen? That I am alive. Because without God guiding me, even the hair-like Blood vessel in my, in my brain will burst. I'm dead. I'm over. My life will be over. Your life will be over. It is only by God's grace that he is guiding a hair-like blood vessel in your brain and in my brain that I, we are still alive today. And we, we can wake up in the morning. Be grateful to him. Pray. But Ellen White said, prayer does not only mean kneeling down. Ellen White said, cultivate the habit of a prayerful attitude in your life always, in whatever you do. Meaning to say, even if you are studying your lesson, you can say, Lord, please be the source of my wisdom. You can pray that. You can pray like that. Or maybe for mothers who are washing the dishes, and you can say, Lord, please remove some jealousy in my heart. As you remove some, you know, some stain in the, in the plate, or probably you're trying to make your, you're washing your clothes and removing some stain. Lord, please remove some greed or selfishness in my life. Or maybe you're cutting some of your flowers in the garden. You can say, Lord, please cut my tongue. Sometimes it's too long, you know. I tend to criticize my pastor, criticize my elder, criticize my fellow church members. I remember a story of a very uh, passionate lady in one of the churches that uh, a pastor was preaching. And uh, this lady wants everything to be exact and to be precise. So when his pastor was, after the pastor was preaching, she was at the door. And she said, Pastor, your message was so nice, but the problem is your necktie is too long. (laughs) And uh, he said, can I cut it? Can I... Can I really cut it to the right size so that you will really look good as a pastor? And the pastor said, why not? After he did that, after she did that, I mean, the pastor said, Sister, can I borrow your scissor? Can I cut your tongue? It's too long. Your tongue is too long. 
Beloved members of this church, I think not only ladies but also men, sometimes our tongue are too sharp and too long to criticize, to diminish others, to make comments that are inimical to others, to speak words that are negative and not uplifting. It should be a part of our daily prayer to say, Lord, please discipline my tongue as well. Amen? And this can happen if all of us are praying or doing or imposing to ourselves the discipline of prayer. Prayer brings power in our personal lives. Less prayer, less power. More prayer, more power. No prayer, of course, no what? No power. You can only be, I can only be totally persuasive to others about my faith if I am totally persuaded. Did you get me? And I can only be totally persuasive, persuaded, I mean, when I am connected with my God through prayer. That's why it's so important. Apostle Paul's counsel to us, Acts 2.42-45, to again, the secret of the infant church, they were praying together, they were having fellowship together, and prayer, daily prayer, was a part of their personal self-imposed discipline. And third, which is third, second to the last, the discipline of reading. The discipline of reading. Sorbet has been made that many Adventists today are suffering from mental indolence. What do you mean by mental indolence? Many of us are lazy in reading. I will repeat. Many of us are lazy in reading. Can you remember our parents before? They have less education, but they read more. They have more time. Most of us will just go to Google. Google and internet. I do not condemn that for more information. But you know, if you want, if I want to learn more lessons in life, I need to have the discipline of reading. Reading God's word, of course. Reading the spirit of prophecy. Huh? I'm sorry to tell you that when I was young, in high school, I never read my Bible and even my spirit of prophecy. What is in my mind always was basketball, basketball, basketball. Whole Sunday we would play basketball. And during, I remember, during Friday, I mean Saturday morning, our, our dean would say, okay, everybody, let's go to church. And there will be uh, sound in our in dormitory in the village where we are staying. Everybody were dusting off their Bibles and their songbooks because for the whole week, we never touch our Bible and our songbooks because what is always in our mind is what? Basketball, basketball, basketball. And sometimes if it's not basketball, I would bring my, uh, in the evening, I would use my flashlight just to read books about war, about detectives, but Bible, no taste at all. Detective stories are so nice. But when the Bible, you read just one text, it's like tranquilizer. <laughs> Immediately, you feel asleep, right? You feel sleepy. I said, what is this? And so when I went to college, I said, Lord, please help me. I am helpless. Help me to love the word of God. And you know what? I started with the great controversy, the book of Ellen White, because it's stories about reformation. There were wars and struggles. And by God's grace, I decided my taste was little by little educated by the Lord to love his word and the spirit of prophecy. And later on, the Bible became very interesting to me, especially if you read the first five, book of the, five first books of Ellen White, the, the Conflict of the Ages series. If you want to have a background of the Old Testament, you read the Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings. 
And then you read the Acts of the Apostles, the Desire of Ages, and the last, of course, the Great Controversy. If you read these five books of Ellen White, you will have an overview of the plan of redemption and you, will, you cannot help but always love to refer it to your Bible and study your Bible because they are so amazing and they are so enriching. And so I challenge everyone, read what? Our Bibles. Read our spirit of prophecy. Read our religious magazines. Know what is happening around the world about our schools, about our denomination and the signs of the times. Do not neglect reading religious reading materials. Again, I will repeat. Apostle Paul's counsel to Timothy, till I come, give attention to what? Reading. Reading. And lastly, lastly, the discipline of revisiting Calvary. How many of you, those of you who have money, I would advise you to visit Israel and go to Calvary and renew your commitment to the Lord. But if it is not possible, maybe that is not possible to all of us, but I would like to challenge everyone to every day revisit Calvary. How? How can you visit, revisit Calvary every day? Read Isaiah 53 every day. Or probably one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, June, I mean, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke and John, especially in the 28 chapters of these four books. And you will see what Jesus did for you and for me at Calvary. Every time you visit, you revisit Calvary, you will realize how valuable you are. You will be educated not to value yourself on what you have done or what you have not done or what you have or what you do not have, but you will be able to value yourself on what Christ did for you and for me at Calvary. Amen? The greatest place where you can see your true value is not at the window of the super store or in the bank or in the window of your beautiful car. The best place for you to see who you are and who I am, how I am is when I looked at the window of Calvary that I am purchased by the blood of Christ. I am not an ordinary person. I need to live a life that is loving and lovable because someone loves me very much and gave his life for me. That is where my true value is. It's not about my upbringing, my humble beginning. It's not about my lousy life in the past. It's about the wonderful God that I am serving, that I see myself, who am I? Amen? And so, revisit Calvary always. Let me close my message this morning with this story. Sometimes after the war, World War II, there was a beautiful Korean lady who was in love to a GI, an American soldier. However, in their relationship, something happened. There was no detail whether the GI died in, the, in action or he went back to America and never remembered her. But the story tells us that the American, that the Korean lady was pregnant. And during the time, Koreans were so, were so conservative because she was pregnant without a husband. Her parents disowned her. Her friends disowned her. Her relatives disowned her. She cannot go anywhere except for her friend who are missionaries across the bridge. There were American couple. There was an American couple that were so nice and loving to her. She would find comfort and seek counsel from them. So every time she is down, she would go there for counsel. But one day, it was December. It was December 25. It was Christmas time. And it was snowing heavily. And she felt that she is about to deliver a baby. And so she ran and said, where shall I go? Shall I go to the hospital? But I have no money. Shall I go to my mother? But probably she will, re she will reject me. Shall I go to my friend? And finally she said, my only hope is to go to my friend, the missionary. During that time, those times, no cell phone yet. So she said, I'll cross the bridge because I know on the other, bridge, on the other side of the bridge, 
my help will come my help cometh but the story tells us that before he crossed she crossed the bridge i mean the baby was already coming out she cannot do anything but to go under the bridge and delivered her what her baby it was already dark and it was so cold the baby was crying what shall i do so she removed her coat and wrapped her baby early the following morning december 26 the pastor missionary was riding on his bike trying to negotiate on the on the snow going to the market he heard a baby crying and it was under the bridge and so the pastor said that must be a baby and it's not coming from any house because there were no houses close to the bridge so he went to the under the bridge and sure enough he found the what the baby she called he called i mean he called the police the the ambulance and the ambulance came the baby and the mother was brought to the hospital and the news broke it was broke but the news was spread i mean um, the news spread that the baby was what was still alive the baby was alive unfortunately the mother died of a frozen lungs because she gave her coat, her life to save her what? Her baby. The doctor were having problems. Who will adopt the baby? And so, the couple missionary said, we will adopt the baby boy. He will be our baby boy. So papers were made, arranged, until later on, the baby boy became the what? The missionary's boy. Ten years later 10 years later the same date december 25 it was christmas time the boy came to his dad and to his mom and said dad mom am i really your child why is it that i look different from from you the color of your skin is dif your nose is different from me i cannot see you in my in my face as i when i looked at the mirror Am I really your child? And with tears in his eye, the dad said, Son, he started to tell the story. Here he told the story 10 years ago of what happened to him and to his mom. The boy cried a lot, went to bed that night with tears in his eyes. The following day, December 26. Father and dad would always see their boy in his bed and wake him up for worship. But they found out that the boy was not there. He was not in the room. So they panicked, the couple panicked and looked for him in the kitchen, but he can be found nowhere. They went to the back door and while the snow was, was uh, dropping heavily, they saw footprints on the what? on the snow. Where was it do going, do you think? Where was it going? You're right. The footprints was going to the breeds. The father followed the footprints. And lo and behold, when he arrived under the breeds, he saw their, bo their boy naked. He was only, ha he was half naked. He was wearing shirt and he was no shirt and kneeling down there and crying. I said, the dad said, son, what are you doing here? It's so cold. It's winter time. Why are you not wearing your coat? What are you doing here? And the boy said, dad, I'm doing this because I just would like to feel how mommy felt when she gave her life for me. I want to feel how much or what mommy felt when she gave her life for me. Beloved members of this church, I'm not perfect. I'm human being like you. But every time I will revisit Calvary, there is born in my heart a desire always to be faithful to him. Amen? 
I challenge you every day. Revisit Calvary. Know for yourself what Christ did for you. And you will have the resolve to be faithful to him. Will you do that? How many of you us would like to have that self-imposed discipline to revisit Calvary? Can I see your hands? Let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, you have promised that your grace is sufficient for us. Help us to have that self-imposed discipline the discipline of personal devotion, the discipline of prayer, the discipline, O oh Lord, of revisiting Calvary. Be with all who are present today that by your grace all of us will have the strong resolve to love our Savior, to love his church, and to love one another because Jesus loves us. And, it, and because of your desire for us to spend eternity with you, make it possible, dear Lord, that when Jesus will come, we will spend, we will be with him and be with you throughout the ages of eternity. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless us. Please stand as we sing our open closing song.
Thank you very much, dear Lord, for your grace that is always sufficient. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to each of you that God in his mercy and power will guide us to live a victorious life from now on till Jesus comes. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated before we go out for our... Uh